everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. First, the novel coronavirus pandemic, which we are still in, and now a race of reckoning across the world after the murder of George Floyd in broad daylight at the hands of those who are sworn to protect and serve. It's a conversation that will not go away for a long time. Many are asking, where is God and the church in all of this? Up next on Another View, a look at why a number of young African Americans are rejecting Christianity as they consider it the white man's religion. Dr. Antipas Harris is here to talk about the Bible and racial and social justice. Stay tuned. Another View is next, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Before we get into our discussion today, I just want to take a couple of minutes for to talk to you a little bit about what happened last week. We were on for two hours, and many of you responded. We thank you for your calls, your very thoughtful emails. I just want to let you all know that those of you who did write me, I promise you I will write you back. This has been an incredibly emotional um, time for me, for for the country, for everyone. And I just did not have the bandwidth to sit down and respond to the many emails that um, I've received. But promise I will get back to you. Those of you who have asked for some resources, I will send them to you. I'm working on it. I promise. The other thing I'd like to do is some good news, which is to say a very Wonderful but belated happy birthday to our audio engineer, Todd Washburn. We love to celebrate birthdays here at Another View. And so we are giving him a hand clap and uh, wishing him all the best. So thank you so much. Also want to bring to your attention that the Mass Poor People's Assembly and March Moral March on Washington is going to be happening on June the 20th, 2020. Now, because of the pardon me, coronavirus pandemic, it is going to be a digital march. And so they are expecting thousands of people to get online and be a part of this two hour program, which will be broadcast on Saturday, June 20th at 10 a.m. Eastern time and 6 p.m. Eastern time. And then again on Sunday, June 21st at 6 p.m. Eastern. I want you to go to June2020.org to be able to tune in and also to sign up if you would like to participate and be a part of this mass movement. This is to work. They're gathering to dramatize the pain and prophetic leadership of the poor and build power to enact our demands. And they are talking and involving uh, the interlocking injustices facing 140 million poor and low income people, which is 40 percent, 43 percent of the nation. So everybody's coming together for this virtual march. If you go to www.june2020.org, you can sign up, you can become a part. There is a chapter here in the Hampton Roads area and um, do your civic duty and check it out. Okay, thanks so much. The Bible, the authentic word of God, very much subjected to man's interpretation of its meaning. It's been used to uplift the African-American community, to tear down the African-American community and to keep blacks in their place. There is a growing movement on the street of the black community to move away from Christianity. And many are asking, is Christianity the white man's religion? Our guest today has a different take. He's no stranger to the Hampton Roads community. Dr. Antipas Harris is a theologian, ordained minister, author, and creator of the Urban Renewal Center at First Presbyterian Church in Ghent. He is currently the president and dean of Jake's Divinity School and is on the pastoral staff with the Potter's House in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Harris, how are you? I am wonderful. It's so wonderful to be be with you today. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, you are so very welcome. You know, everything that has been going on, it's been an extremely um, uh, trying time. And I know on top of that, with the coronavirus, and you lost your grandmother, I believe, during this yep. time. And so we want to do, you're, you're so used to reaching out and checking on others. Let us do a check-in on you. How are you doing? Oh, wow. That's so nice of you. Uh, it's been quite a journey, uh, to be frank with you. Uh, sometimes, as I tell people, 
Uh, we we learn in the deep south. Uh, you don't know if you're going or coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, feel, you know I know that moving. it feels right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you know you're moving. That's yes. the good part. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I know exactly what you're talking about. So, you know, when I posted this, that you were going to be my guest today, it got a lot of traction and people were very, very interested in this whole idea of the Bible and, and Christianity being considered the white man's religion. You know, it's a pretty provocative title for your book. And I know there's a backstory as to why you even wrote it. Can you share that backstory with us? Yes, uh, thank you. I was uh, teaching a course on leadership uh, at Regent University, actually, a graduate mm-hmm. course. And a 22-year-old student, African-American young man, raised his hand and asked me a question that had nothing to do with the lecture but the uh, look in his eyes was very sincere, and I thought that it was worth um, exploring. The question was, uh, my friends are leaving the faith uh, and saying that Christianity is a white man's religion. What do you say to your friends who are leaving the church? Uh, and that struck me as a question that I've heard before, of course, that was made popular in the 50s and 60s with uh, Malcolm X. Uh, and a lot of uh, folks were asking that question uh, during the civil rights movement. But as we explored the question in the in the class, uh, more and more students in the class were were acquainted with the question as one that was vibrant on the streets. So quickly, mm-hmm. I started to realizing that there was something I need to know. I wasn't woke enough, so mm-hmm. I started to uh, explore more and discovered that this is very vibrant, uh, very. A, seri- a very serious question, and there have been churches that have been split and closed around those uh, around this question. Mm-hmm. Case in point, in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, here in Dallas is popular, in Boston, Atlanta, Norfolk, uh, Richmond, everywhere, uh, Chicago, and uh, many of the folks who are asking these questions are being attracted to uh, Black Hebrew Israelites, Nation of Islam, um, They've been attracted to uh, Wiccan science and science of consciousness uh, and some self-proclaimed witches. And then there is a, a there is a small group of folk asking this question who still subscribe to the Christian faith, but they are in their own time and with their own friends exploring other uh, ideologies. So they call it expanded consciousness, where I believe in the church, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe in burning um, burning, um, um, you know, incense mm-hmm. and uh, crystal ball, praying crystal balls and mixing other elements from other religious expressions. You know, you hear a lot of talk about it's some, it's much more about spirituality than it is about religion. Do you see right. a difference? Do you make a difference was, in that? Yes, I should say burning sage was what I was saying uh-huh. just a minute ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there, there is, according to Pew Research, uh, there is an uptick in uh, the search for spirituality. While people are leaving the church, they are not leaving spirituality. So there are more people saying that they're spiritual and not religious. Uh, there is a decline in commitment to the Christian faith, according to, uh, to to the Pew Research. So, yeah, absolutely. More people, this search for spirituality is more fluid. It's more integrated with everyday life. It's a way of trying to understand life and how does God relate to everyday life and find oneself in the mix, in the mix of it. Mm-hmm. So where did, where's the disconnect? Why is it that they can't find that in Christianity? Well, because the, the argument is that uh, Christianity is part, well, multiple layers. One mm-hmm. is that historically Christianity was sponsored by a racist, I, uh, I, Christianity sponsored racism in the development of the Western world, or in America in particular. Uh, And also, church as we know it, many of them feel uh, that they exist for themselves and not for the community. So Mm -hmm. let's go back to the first one. According to research, this generation is reading more than previous previous generations. Now, this is partly because of the Internet, and there's just, this is an information age. People can, you have so much Access information it. coming at you all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it means also that people who are searching for meaning and identity and God are also filtering through a lot of information for discovery. And in that search, they're discovering parts of history that have been left out of the American history books. 
things like, um, you know, how blacks came across uh, the transatlantic and the, the harsh treatment of slavery. And I've even lately had conversations with people who are just now knowing about the Tulsa race riots mm. uh, and some other parts of history that have been sort of um, excluded from American history books in the classrooms. So this discovery raises a lot of questions about the role that Christianity played, not only in slavery, but the Holocaust and the apartheid in South Africa. And mm-hmm. it paints this very difficult picture that many times the church does not know how to reckon with. And so it leaves people wondering and questioning, why would I subscribe to a faith that uh, in hit the history reveals people who said they were Christians did some pretty, pretty mean things? Um, and so that's one issue. The other issue is more the contemporary mm-hmm. expression of the church sometimes is disconnected from the life and experiences on the street. So the church becomes like a, like a country club. It, you become a member, and it plays to your needs rather than the needs of the larger community. And there is a real desire to encounter and discover God who gives meaning beyond the walls of the church. You know, I watched a, um, a Netflix documentary um, last weekend. It was called Contradiction, A Question of Faith. And and in the documentary, they were talking about the, the plethora of churches that are in the black community. And mm-hmm. the question was raised about Christianity encouraging black, get, kind of letting black folks off the hook, if you will, in terms of moving themselves forward, and that the that the mantra becomes, you know, just wait on God, just just stay mm-hmm. in prayer, mm-hmm. just don't do anything. Um, mm-hmm. And and these young people were saying, no, no, we got to get out, we got to, we have to to, you know, push for what we want. We've got to make these things happen. So mm-hmm. how do we? How how do we address that? How does the church address that? Because clearly, as you said, they're reading, they're learning different things, they're questioning a lot. What's the answer? Well, I think we need a holistic response. We need a multidisciplinary mm-hmm. response. Uh, mm-hmm. The spiritual one, prayer, I think is key. However, uh, there's more to life than simply praying in a monastery, right? Uh, there's <laughs> the social dynamic. What we have here in America is a social construct that was built uh, 400 years ago, uh, and systems were built on top of that to sustain that construct that is a racist construct. The whole concept of race is unintelligible. We can't even define what race is if we'll press hard to try to define it uh, the way that we use it, the, mm-hmm. the, the term these days or throughout American history. It was the assumption that black people were not human. And so while we don't say that out loud, we keep that that language in, uh, we keep that ideological framework in our language by saying things like, you are of that race, the white race, and I'm of the black race. We need to problematize the language, Mm. number one, because it's built on a social construct that is detrimental to the present, the past, and the future. So one of the things we need to do is not just problematize the language, but we also need to address the, the social structures that were set in place that demean black people and people of color in general, because, and I say people of color in general, because what we see on the borders with, um, uh, with the undocumented immigrants and the dreamers is it's, it's, it's the ramifications of a superstructure that were put in place to make black people not human. So now you have the Brown people who are inheriting some of that uh, social um, debacle as well. But the root is, this issue of racism that was initially uh, an indictment on the humanity of black people. Mm-hmm. And what's sad about that was that religion sanctioned it. Yeah. Because colonization and, and colonization and racism are two sides of the same coin. And when um, the colonizers went to Africa and, um, and the merchants sort of ripped the, uh, the, the valuables from the African soil to bring to the new world, to start a new world, uh, they told them that they were cursed and that they have redemption through baptism and through through um, the exploration of the new land. And that way, they use religion, God, guns, right? God, guns mm-hmm. in the Bible, mm-hmm. to bring people to this country uh, or to the new world to develop this country. But the framework, the social framework that 
set this country in motion uh, was a racist one. And the systems, and we're talking about systems, police system, the education system, uh, going down the list of systems, they were set in motion to uphold whites and to keep blacks down. And the best we've gotten over the years is try to prop it up and try to change it a little bit. Uh, but what we really need is the deconstruction of all of it mm-hmm. and reconstructing under a new premise. So I guess that they're questioning also then, if knowing that that's how uh, Christianity was used in order to control um, right. a, a group of people, why then does a group of people even buy into it? You know, <laughs> well, the, the, the group of people didn't really buy into it. They were powerless socially. That's why I'm saying mm. you know, it can't just be a spiritual dis- discussion. Mm-hmm. It's a social discussion as well. They were powerless politically and socially. Uh, and so they didn't necessarily buy into it. Um, for the most part, they started their own churches. That's how we got the quote unquote black church, uh, because they didn't buy into it. They just, um, they learned about a God who was separate than the God of the oppressor. And but um, and so what's happening now, though, is that the young people on the street are saying, yeah, you started the black church, but you're still using their God. Right. And, and I guess that's the, the point I was trying to get to is right is, is trying to understand then the if if this is the religion of the oppressor. And mm-hmm. and the oppressed take it to make it their own. You're you you posit in your book that the Bible supports that and that it, in fact, is not the white man's religion. Am I correct in that? That's right. So what I'm saying is that the the they debunked the white man's expression of mm. Christianity. Um, and what I'm arguing for uh, against the contemporary argument that they took the white man's God, I'm simply saying, no, they returned to the first century and rediscovered uh, who the biblical God was. And I'm arguing that the biblical God is not the God of the oppressor. And that what we have there is a hijacking of the biblical God and using it in a very, um, very, very heinous way, uh, a terrible expression uh, or usage of the, it's a hijacking of the biblical God to use to arbitrate oppression. And I'm saying, no, mm. let's go back to the biblical God and rediscover that the God of the Bible is a God of liberation, not of oppression. That's the point. Absolutely. Because yeah. I wanted to get to get to that whole idea of liberation, because, you know, th- there are so many times when the Bible is used as a as a, a means of being passive. But that's not really what was happening in the Bible. That's right. And, and there are multiple things that are, that I think we've been misguided about. I, I'm I'm pleasantly surprised when I tell people that the writer of the first and not the gospel uh, was from Africa. Mark, the book of Mark was written by John Mark. John Mark was from Karini, which is in Africa. He was an African. Mm-hmm. Um, when you look through it, someone asked me, was Obed Edom in the Bible black? And I said, well, let me just say this. The problem is the question, because you're presupposing that if Obed Edom was black, wow. And that's mm-hmm. a wow amidst a, a, an assumption that the rest of the people in the Bible were white. I say, mm. so that in itself is a problematic because the people of the Bible were people of color. All of them, about 95% of the people in the Bible were people of color. Um, that means some were from Africa and some were from uh, the Middle East. In those days, it was considered, especially in the Old Testament, Afro-Asiatic context. We didn't have a colonized world in the way that we have it now. So we, they didn't think the separations the way we think of the separations today. Uh, in terms of boundaries, of national boundaries and continental boundaries. Mm -hmm. But the region was an Afro-Asiatic context, and all of the people were people of color. Hmm. So, okay, the the big question, is is Jesus the one with the long blonde hair and the bright blue eyes, or is he someone else? (laughs) That's the Jesus of faith for the person who painted that picture. Um, but mm-hmm. the historical Jesus, absolutely not. The historical Jesus would have been a, a man of color. Mm. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call, I'm sure. There are tons of you out there who would like to join this conversation. Give us a call at 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Dr. Harris, what are some of the tenets that we can find in the Bible that support the fact that 
God wanted all of us to be treated as humans and 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 for that social construct to get beyond the, the racism. Good. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 uh, talks about uh, Jesus coming to break down the middle wall of partition that were between the Gentiles and the Jews. It was the idea that Jesus wanted to expand the household of God beyond um, the historical um, Israelites to include all of God's creation. So we enter into God's family through faith in Jesus Christ, because he broke down the walls of petition, petition that divided people. Um, we can look in the book of Galatian, where Paul says that in him, in Christ, we are neither uh, bond nor free, Jew nor Gentile, uh, or male or female. We're one in Christ. Uh, we can just look at the symbol- symbolism of the cross, where the vertical of the cross symbolizes the reuni- reuniting, the reconciliation between human and God, and the, vert- and the horizontal of the cross it symbolizes God's arms reached out to bring broken humanity to God, uh, to one family in Christ. Uh, so to me, the Bible is riddled with all types of expressions of God's intention in Christ to bring people together and to liberate us as one people with equal standing before God and equal standing before each other. And that's the message that was hijacked and used in a very adverse way throughout Christian history. So if we have the black church, then why aren't we talking about this in the black church? In other words, why? I think, where, where's the disconnect that, that our young people are saying, we're out of here? Well, I think part of the disconnect uh, in the black church is that um, these young people don't want to be siloed over in the black corner. They want to be Mm. integrated in in the broader society. Uh, I think young Mm. people want to bring the best of the black church together with the broader society. And there's a plea for us not to just be over in the corner of ourselves. You see, this is this problem of racism is a is a social problem. And we all are victims of that social problem, whites and blacks. Blacks mm-hmm. are, are maybe underprivileged, and whites may be privileged, but we are all victims non- nonetheless. And I think what the young people are saying is that we want to break out of this mold where wherein we have to be over in the black corner, because m- many blacks would like to be in relationship with the broader society. They, this is not a black takeover. It's not a let's right. go over in our corner and separate from the rest of the world. Is how can we be more integrated in a way that is um, that is empowering? That's one issue. The other issue, I think, is that um, while the black church is a staple in the black community, um, even the black church is beneficiaries of the underprivileged in society as well. Think about it. Um, black churches don't get the, um, the they're struggling as well. Uh, for finances and to get a voice in the larger society. They may have a voice in the black community, but in the larger society, we still are saying, hey, listen, we need PPP, for example, or mm-hmm. we need, um, we, they're advocating for the community and in, in the distressed areas. So in a way, there's a plea across the board for a better society. Hmm. There was a question we got from Facebook. They wanted to know, is the church changing or is the church shaping culture or is it being shaped by culture? I think historically the church has been shaped by culture, um, which is the is the antithesis of what it should do. We can look mm-hmm. at the Methodist movement, uh, starting with John Wesley, who said to Wilberforce, I, I want you to end slavery. Um, that was in the 1700s. By the time we got to the 1800s, um, Frederick Douglass, who was a Methodist minister, was preaching against slavery. The Methodists told him that he was a heretic for preaching against slavery when the founder of the movement said, get rid of it. So that mm. we see in 100 years, culture ha- had hijacked the church. The same thing in the Baptist movement with the Southern Baptist Church, the same thing with the Pentecostals. They start out boasting that we are into, we are the miracle in Azusa, at Azusa Street in California, where black and white people were working, worshiping together. A historian said that the blood of Christ had washed away the color line. Well, by 1921, the Pentecostal Church had split as well. The Mm -hmm. Assemblies of God split from the Church of God in Christ. The UPC split from the PAW, all along racial lines. These are examples of how culture hijacked the mission of the church, and the church then was following culture rather than culture following the church. Now, I think that it's not that neatly, um, because it's not that neatly put, 
because there are some places where the church has influenced culture, but by and large on this race issue, the culture has hijacked the church. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the Bible and justice, identity, and culture with theologian and minister Dr. Antipas Harris, author of Is Christianity the White Man's Religion? How the, How the Bible is Good News for People of Color. Our phone lines are lit up, so let's take some calls. Let's talk to Ray in Hampton. Hi, Ray. You're on the air. Hello. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, I just had a few quick comments. Um one is why don't we go back to Christianity's original African root? Like in Ethiopia, they trace the Bible, their version of the Bible, back to biblical times. Why have we just, on faith value alone, just accepted the Christianity that was given to us during slavery? You know, there's so many drawings of slave owners in the middle of a church while a pastor is speaking to his parishioners. And lastly, why sh- why can't we just simply walk away from this when one of the original sh- slave ships was called the Good Ship Jesus, which shows that they had no differentiation in reference to the will of God and slavery. It was all the same to them, that they were able to do it because God willed it. Okay, let's let uh, Dr. Harris answer your questions. Thanks, Ray, for the call. Dr. Harris? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Yes, the Ethiopian Bible, uh, I think part of the challenge would be um, the the connectedness between uh, the North America and the African continent. Uh, There's not, um, for African Americans, um, continue now more than ever to try to reconnect with the, uh, the continent of Africa. And so Ethiopia would be part of that that conversation. What resources are in Ethiopia that might be able to inform uh, our new vision of of Christianity? Uh, so I think that's a very valid point, and um, it, that's one. It's just a matter of learning knowledge, mm-hmm. right? And then the second part is you're correct. Um, the the colonizers did use faith and name ships uh, in the name of their faith. Uh, and it it seems very odd to us today that people would, would enslave people in the name of any god, uh, much less than Jesus Christ, who was who came to liberate humanity. And and the New Testament is very clear about that liberation of captives. Mm-hmm. Um, so it it's it's a very difficult history to reckon with. Uh, it's real. Uh, I think it misrepresents Scripture. Um, but you're right. It, it, and I talk about that in my book. I talk about those slave ships and how they were used uh, and the names of those slave ships. That's the Kathy joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Kathy. You're on the air. Hey, how are you? OK. Good. Um, my my comment is that I, I think that people. In the best sense, take a refuge in this so-called Bible. I disagree with having people's power their own personal power, their own opinions, their own uh, sense of right and wrong, usurped by somebody, whoever wrote this thing. And people use it as a weapon to justify their actions. And I think that it's wrong. And I just, I understand that the Black church was a wonderful haven, at least. It was somewhere where people could gather and not be, you know, attacked. But it, to, to say that we are going to give our power to this book and try to find a message that justifies our actions, I think is a waste of time. I think we know way too much about how we should treat each other and stop trying to uh, just give away our own sense of right and wrong. Okay. Thank you for the call, Kathy. How would you respond, Dr. Harris? Yes, um, I think, uh, thank you for the question uh, or the comment. Uh, I think that when you talk about the way people use something, people can use anything, any kind of way. You can use, um, the Constitution is being used any kind of way. So I don't think that you can throw away the baby with the bathwater, if you will. Just because people use it in a diabolical way doesn't mean that there is no value in the thing itself. Uh, I hold that Scripture is sacred writ, and it is um, 
the test of testimony of God that we that is valuable. It's hard to read scripture and take it seriously and come out with some of the conclusions that people have made. Uh, if you actually read the book, now I know the president was holding it in his hand in front of a church, but if you open this thing up and read it, I think it will be transformative in a very positive way. And it can actually draw us into a liberation and a freedom and love and hope and justice and righteousness that we desperately need in our day and time. So reading it is key rather than holding it or referencing it or just referring to what people, how people used it. So, uh, Dr. Harris, what are these other um, choices that people have, be uh, the Muslim movement, black Hebrews, et cetera? What are they offering that Christianity is not? Yeah, good. I mentioned this a little bit in the book that black black Hebrew Israelites uh, tend to they they exist on a continuum. Uh, some believe in Jesus and some don't. Uh, but the key is that they reconnect with the Hebrew Bible, and they believe that African Americans or African people are um, part of the lost tribes of Israel. And that scripture in the Hebrew Bible speaks not only to uh, what it means for us to be the people of God, but it also gives an explanation for some of the harsh history we've endured. Mm -hmm. So it's this idea in Deuteronomy that because we walked away from the truth of God's law, uh, we ended up in slavery. But it also says that if you turn to God, that God will receive you and and so the assumption is that Black Hebrew Israelites get some sort of theological meaning of the harsh history that Black people have experienced, but they also find identity, which is key. They find identity in the text and believe that if we subscribe to the faith, uh, we return to God. And then thirdly, some that are more radical believe that all Scripture also shows that people who are harsh toward Black people— uh, are themselves going to receive some sort of judgment. So there's a vindication in there. Mm. So there is identity, there is definition of history, and there's vindication. Um, and some believe that in Jesus, as I said, uh, and some don't. Mm. So what does the the church, be it black church, white church, the church, in terms of Christianity, need to do in order to um, convince folks that they need to come back to the fold if they've left? Well, I think part of it is we have to be something. We have to be a witness rather than go out and, and, and do lip service. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy who was a former um, drug pusher said to me, Doc, you got to take your religion to the streets. What mm -hmm. he really meant was that um, you got to be out there leading in a way that make people see that you truly care. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. said the church has got to be a headlight and stop being a taillight. And what I see today is we're still being a taillight, a light, which is good, but a taillight um, mm. behind. Um, we can see that in some of the some of the some of the reactions to the protests, uh, the George Floyd in the aftermath of killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and um, Ahmaud Arbery. Uh, mm. We see at first it was the young, it was the culture, it was the people who reacted to this terrible crime instead of the church at first jumping out there with them to fight against it we got a lot of people criticizing and overstating some of the rioting and suggesting that the rioting was the definition of the movement and it wasn't right. um it was at, at best infiltrators who were not even part of the sincerity of the movement um but uh and then of course uh, in some places, we have um, marches that were that were great that churches are doing and prayer walks and so forth. And my my sense is that what we don't need, well, well, what we need is a continuation of leadership. We don't just need to march; we need to do something that's not already been done, like march down to city hall and get something changed, march down to the school board and get something changed. You know, we still have in Norfolk one school board, and it looks like the tale of two cities, where the white people side of town, the schools are nicer than in the black side of town. Why is that? Go mm -hmm. get that change. Get something changed. Do something that is radical. You know, I know there's a housing um, discussion now. Churches get together, and just like we get together in March, let's get together and build a community. Yeah. Let, let's do something that really impacts the community. 
Because if you don't, then it just seems like it's the same old, same old. You it's know what just I mean? lip service. Absolutely. Let's talk to Kim from Kilmarnock. Hi, Kim. You're on the air. Hi, um, Dr. Harris. I have two questions for you. Um, one was Moses' wife from Ethiopia. And yes. number two, we have a lot of churches in my area that are black churches and white churches. How can we remedy this? They below, you know, they're Christians, but they will not intermingle. Thank you so much yeah. for that call, Kim. Dr. King said that 11 o'clock was the most segregated hour in America. And it remains the most segregated <laughs> yes. hour in America. He said that in the 60s. It mm-hmm. still is the same way. And it's because of the point that I made earlier. Christianity in this country started with racism. <laughs> and it has not paused and lamented it and really taken seriously. Not a moment, but you got to turn this into a movement of transformation. Um, and so here's a, here's to response to the statement earlier about Moses' wife from Ethiopia. That's, that's correct. And there's mm-hmm. an assumption when you read Scripture through the lens of race, there's an assumption that somehow Moses was the Moses of the Ten Commandments, the movie, Mm-hmm. So he was a white guy, and he married this black lady from Ethiopia. And that's what I mean by a fallacy. Moses was not himself a white guy. He was not European. Uh, Moses was also a man of color. I know the movies didn't tell us that, but that's... Anyway, that, I go into that a bit in the book as well. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the issue was that she was from another nation, not that she was black and he was white. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the historically it was just that he was, uh, of, of the people, he was an Israelite and she was from Ethiopia and that it wasn't a race problem in the churches that, um, many churches, I remember one time I was being interviewed for a social pastor of a church in LaGrange, Georgia. And the first question, it was a white church. Yeah. And the pastor asked was, tell me this, what do you think about interracial marriage? And I was taken aback. Uh, I was in college. Because mm-hmm. I was like, what, uh, what's wrong with it? He said, well, not that I got a problem with it, but you know, you guys come up in here and you marry one of these uh, white girls, you have kids and they wouldn't know if they're white or black. Mm. That's the kind of silliness that many of these churches continue to hold on to. That is absolutely not even worth the conversation because mm-hmm. it doesn't even make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the question that the lady was saying about the churches um, and sort of the um, interrelationships that are there, I think part of the problem is those are the churches that are pers- preserving racism, mm-hmm. and they have not reckoned with the fact that this whole notion of race is unintelligible. It makes no sense whatsoever, and um, they have not reckoned with the fact that they are also sinning against the gospel that they claim to perpetuate by trying to hold on to something as diabolical as racism. You know, in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Do you think that, that it is even more um, prescient, I guess, in terms of your book and the question that you ask based on the evangelical church and it's and and how it has manifested itself politically in this country um and in terms of why that might be yet another reason why young people are rejecting christianity oh absolutely because it's it it it, for a person who is woke as they say on the street Mm -hmm. and fully aware of the social debacle called racism and the system set in place is not hard for us to see a racist president. It's not hard for us to see um, some of the racism that is perpetuated in politics. It's not hard to see it. It's not hard to see that um, when you say you're pro-life, but then you are not on board with Black Lives Matter and you don't support, um, you know, um, health care reform, um, it, it's not hard to see how racism is laced in all of that. Mm-hmm. It's not hard to see that it's racist to attack guys on their knee on the football field when they are protesting against the killing of African American men, and when the churches are the ones who re- viscerally responded negatively rather than understanding what the problem is. To me, 
all of that is nothing but a, a picture of racism. When we say racism, that's what we're talking about. Those and so mm-hmm. when uh, do you agree? <laughs> I mean, that's what I see. I'm like, it's ra- I'm like, this is racist. And so, um, so, so it, and, and the thing is, instead of trying to take it on, they just say, you know what? We just put that over there and we just go over here and do our own thing. Mm. Joyce, uh, Josh, I'm sorry. Josh joins us from Suffolk. Hi, Josh. You're on the air. Hey, uh, if anything, my, my question for Doc was everything was, I know I've seen a lot of my, Peers have these, uh, especially in the faith-based community, have these panel discussions, uh, and and on a weekly basis, they're they're having a black guy on stage with them because they're a white-led uh, community, but they're trying to be uh, hip and cultural. Um, and a lot of times, for us as black parishioners, uh, it becomes one of those things where it's like, do we really have to go through this conversation? If obviously we're all on the same page about this. Uh, God that you know delivers. If that should be something that we're in our minds as a as a faith based community, um, how is it that we once again are getting this feeling of reiterating a story that seems to be hitting us in the face day by day, almost louder and louder, and we once again bear the burden of of that story? It's it's one of those things where me as a black male, I want to be the compassionate man that needs to be out there and my black Hebrew Israelite brothers are giving me the ammunition to feel empowered that something could change. What's some tips to kind of like actually be a more vocal, uh, Mm. faith-based parishioner to be able to make that work? Good question, Josh. Thanks so much for that call. So he wants to know what can he do to back it up so that, (laughs) so that he can support his belief. Yeah, no, I think what I'm trying to do in the book is reintroduce Christianity and help people understand that there is an authentic Christianity that responds to the everyday life in a very liberational way. And so if I say that to take time to read in Scripture, and there are some, there are some books by people like James Cone, who's addressed this issue of uh, sort of uh, rethinking Christianity. He's got one called The Cross and the Lynch- Lynching Tree. He's got mm-hmm. another one um, the, you know, God, God of the oppressed. Um, so those books will help you to rethink uh, Christianity through the lens of African-American experience. Uh, they're not the only one. I would also encourage you to get my book, of course, um, is Christianity, the White Man's Religion. Uh, I think that part of the challenge here for us, though, is that we got to be willing to go through the process of having the tiring conversation because to be honest with you, African Americans have talked about this for years, but we're many times we're talking to ourselves uh, because Black History Month becomes that that month that Black people can 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 have their events to themselves. Um, it's it's not really celebrated broadly throughout the nation, um, and usually these race conversation is is us talking to us, um, and and so I think that now the beauty of this is that of the movement is that it is multicultural. When you look at the protests and the rallying and all, there are more people interested in this discussion. And many of them have always been interested in the discussion, but we have not corralled together. And I think now is a, is a very interesting time. I don't know if it was COVID-19 that created a perfect storm or what it was, but it came together where there are actually, in many cases, more whites out there protesting. Look around the world. They're in France and Europe and, I mean, uh, France and UK and other Sweden, they're mm-hmm. everywhere supporting this cause. So now is not the time to get tired and get weary uh, with the pastors wanting to have the conversation. I'm glad they want to have the conversation because there was a time they wouldn't have the conversation. That's... So if they want to have the conversation, you can invite me. I'll be as candid as you'd like me to be. <laughs> 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 uh, because, it, because we need to have this conversation. We all are victims of the same problem. Thankfully, we're getting to the point where the white community is realizing that it's also a victim. They didn't create it, right? It was created mm-hmm. for all of us. They're yeah. privileged by it, but they didn't create it. So we're all victims of this problem, and it's everybody's problem. To make a better world for the future, it gives us an opportunity to express it from our vantage point so that people will understand what the challenges really are, and we can carve out a better future together. Okay. Jeff joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Jeff. You're on the air. 
Hey, how are you? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for this show. Oh, you're uh, welcome. This is, wow, I have been studying this and, and looking at this subject for quite a while. And, and what I'd like to interject is the responsibility for a personal study. You know, the Word tells us to seek and you shall find. God says, come and let us reason together. You know, and then the, the verse that seems to me is when the Apostle Paul said, blessed are the Bereans, but when they have heard the Word, they go back and read it for themselves. We, I think we have to look at that personal responsibility that we have to get in ourselves to understand, you know, what it is that God is saying and, and what His promises are and what He has for us. He has opened that door, and uh, I think there's a, a reliance on the corporate structure of the church too heavily to answer the questions that we need to get in and seek for ourselves. Biblical Greek and Hebrew are still live languages, and some scholars out there have even um, uh, written books on the Aramaic language, so you can get in there, get those definitions, read that word, study and pray as you should, and I believe the answers will come, and anything else you get from the corporate structure serves as a uh, confirmation or in addition to what you've already gotten for yourself. Okay, thanks so much for that call, Jeff. We appreciate that. Jeff says self-study, Dr. Harris. I think self-study is really important, but uh, I think even more important is quality information. Mm -hmm. Because some people are studying, but because we're in the information age, everything is out there. You can read anything you want to read, listen to whatever you want to listen to. That doesn't mean it's quality or it's true. I've seen a lot of preachers who do read, um, you know, I don't know where they get the Greek and Hebrew from, but they integrate it in their sermons. And I'm sitting there as a person who ha who has studied Hebrew and Greek, and I'm thinking, that's actually not correct. But they're given information, they've gotten mm -hmm. it from somewhere, uh, and it sounds like they're educated. So there is the such thing as a bad information. Um, and so I think it's important that we get quality information. Uh, and, and especially when we talk about American education system, uh, higher education system I'm speaking of in particular, that is built on a European model. When you look at theology in some of our universities or philosophy, uh, it is built on a European model, and it excludes a lot of African thought. Uh, and so I think that, particularly in theology, theology mm -hmm. needs to be reformed in this society. So that study, because study is built on the very premise that we're arguing against right now. So how, so... <laughs> um, this Lord, the glorifying of the Enlightenment and and um, Immanuel Kant and people like it's like these guys were racist and so now you, that's in the theological system it mm. needs to be over overturned. How do you determine then that it's quality? I mean, we're I think, in, is is there a magic way, or you just really have to to weigh what you read on one side versus the other and and figure it out for yourself. I think that's a great question. I think, and it's not an easy answer. Uh, I think what I mean by quality now is correct for one, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've heard people say things like rhema and logos, and rhema means the spoken word and logos means the written word. That's absolutely incorrect. So mm -hmm. that's not correct way of understanding Greek. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I mean. Now, you can okay. Google that and find it everywhere with the meaning that people want people argue against me, but there is a historical usage of the term and there's an actual meaning of the term. So um, and unless you know that, then you just go with whatever put, people put on Wikipedia, wherever they put it. Wow. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is when, when education is myopic or only, only um, expressed from one vantage point, cultural vantage point, I think then it is limiting itself because it's not only people from that culture vantage point who's reading and learning. So like, for instance, as much as I love Shakespeare, I even preach sermons from his, from some of his work, mm -hmm. but I can't help but wonder why do we force young people to learn Shakespeare and not Maya Angelou or L mm -hmm. Langston Hughes, some people who are actually born in this country. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, but they're black, and what they have to say is not as important. 
So what I'm saying is that we have encoded in our education system this idea that white is right. And so what if we're going to be honest about this conversation about racism, this is not will you be my friend kind of stuff. This yeah. is ideological superstructure. This is social. Um, this is a social um, debacle. It infiltrates education. It infiltrates economics. It has to do with who get contracts and who don't, what side of town people live on and the redlining stuff. I mean, it, it goes deep into life. It's not who I want to vote for in presidential election among two people. No, it's deeper than that. It's yeah. life. Yeah. How? So we only have a minute left. I can't believe it. Actually, a minute 30 left. But I got to ask you this. <laughs> are pastors talking about this? Are you guys coming together and trying to figure it out in terms of how to to represent, if you will, the gospel so that it makes sense to people? I would say there are more conversations about it now than there has been in the past. Okay. Um, when they thought what they had worked for them, this was an agitation to what they were doing. But now they're realizing that what they're doing is not working. So more and more are interested in having the conversation. Dr. Antipas Harris, his book is called Is Christianity the White Man's Religion? Thank you so very much for joining us today. I tell you, the phones are still lit up, so I am quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we're going to continue to hear from from folks. We really appreciate you calling, and we'll be right back. So we were supposed to bring you a story today on a 13-year-old young lady who has sickle cell and because of the conversation with Dr. Harris, we ran over. However, we will be bringing you that story next Friday. I do want to make you aware, though, that next Friday, June 19th, is World Sickle Day. And in an effort to promote awareness, they're asking everyone to wear a red shirt and turn on a flashlight, cell phone light, porch light, or any light at 8 p.m., on June 19th and then post your lighting picture on Facebook at facebook.com slash sickle cell HRVA. This is to bring awareness to a this disease that affects African-Americans. And wait until you hear this young lady's story. It is just incredible. So she will be with us next Friday. But remember, next Friday is World Sickle Day, Friday, June 19th, 8 p.m., asking you to wear a red shirt and turn on your flashlight, cell phone light, porch light, or any light, and then post your picture to Facebook at facebook.com slash sickle cell HR. VA. Thank you so much for listening to another view today. We so appreciate you. Please turn us on to your friends by sharing the podcast of today's show or any of our shows. You can also find us at anotherviewradio.org and you can find your or any place you find your favorite podcast. Also, sign up for our eView newsletter so you can keep up with our show topics. We're on Facebook and I'm on Twitter. Next week on Another View, the true story of a forbidden love between a priest and a nun complicated by race. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. And Dr. Barry Graham answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Keep wearing your mask, washing your hands, staying six feet apart, and staying home when you can. And please keep having productive conversations about race. Now is the time. See you next Thursday for another view.